I'll tell you what I wanted to be is I want to be George Clooney selling coffee and tequila. That really <laughs> frees you up to do the movies you want to do. It was fun. I had fun every day on Armageddon. It just turned out to be like a, a long form version of one of those uh, male topless calendars, like in a garage, carrying a tire, kind of greased up. It's been one of the great pleasures of you know my life to get to know Kevin. I promised him um, I would thank him if we ever uh, got an Oscar and promptly forgot. Uh, and then I told him if I ever win again, I swear to God, I'm gonna thank you and forgot again. Ben Affleck, it's great to see you here today. <laughs> hey there, man. Welcome to the Red Carpet. It's such a pleasure. Yeah, to uh, your, your new movie. But yeah, we're here to talk about The Tender Bar, which is directed by George Clooney. And, uh, and, and it's a movie that you star in. And I guess I first became aware of it when you called me very excited that you read a great script that Bill Monaghan wrote. And... Uh, George offered you a job. I promptly called George and he said to me that it was because you were cheaper than me. He told like me you argued too much. <laughs> I got tired of dealing with Damon's bullshit. I, I figured you're going to do what I tell you, right? He I'm wants someone to just take his notes and not say anything. I have no idea how but you are going to law school. So you can sue your father for child support. No, so he can help with your fines about the septic tank. No, here we go. You have said publicly that you received some of the best uh, direction of your career from Georgie. So I was wondering, uh, I was wondering if you could help people understand what that looks like and and, and why why you would say that and, and what that means. Well, um, first of all, you know, because you'd worked with George, I had worked with George and knew him um, well and, and liked him quite a bit. And you've always been very smart about picking great directors and lucky that good directors have picked you. And we were talking about this the other day, the degree to which I feel like you always really understood that very early on. I remember, you know, George being somebody about whom you just like, you know, raved and, and really loved working with as a director and, and had such great experiences with. Uh, so aside from being, you know, deeply jealous and um, developing a sense of inadequacy and self-loathing, I did think, oh, that would be nice one day if that, that happened to me. And and so I got the chance to, yeah, he just called me out of the blue. And I was, it's like, you know, you know how it is. It's a, it's a rare thing that a, that a sort of finished, wonderful script shows up with a really great director. And it's just like, you know, all you have to do is have the, like, you know, to just basically be conscious and sentient and say, yes. I mean, especially today, right? Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's, I knew that this was kind of mine to screw up. I couldn't imagine there weren't a long line of people that wanted to take this part. I really respected, you know, his confidence and faith in me. And I, I wanted to do well for him. There's an emotional scene, the thing where I, I give the kid a car, you know, and every time I read the script, you know, I cried and it moved me and we got to shoot the big scene and I showed up and I really got ready and did my, and then we did the first take and I felt that and the emotion was welling. And I thought, God, this is really, this is it. This is all working. And George came over and I thought like, well, this is that nice moment when the director comes over to you and it's like, yeah, that's really it. You know, I said, yeah, I felt, I think it felt pretty good. And he said, yeah, yeah. Uh, giving a car to someone is fun. <laughs> what? What did he say? Giving a car to someone is fun. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> Right. Yes, of course. I've been playing completely wrong. I was about to ruin it. And now it's going to be really good because of this really simple piece of direction. George has this gift of succinctness and, and insight and also just really good instincts about the way drama works and what's effective to an audience, but also just, you know, being directed by somebody who's done this job you know, that I've been trying to do for, you know, I don't know, 30 years is such a comfort and a relief. I just thought like, well, now I really have no excuse, you know, but, but, you know, paradoxically, because it was so fun and I felt so safe and comfortable and my dad worked in a bar, as you know, and I went up there and visit and all that stuff was very familiar to me. So it just felt really easy. And my only concern was, I, I should I be working harder than this? It shouldn't feel this smooth and i've always said as an actor your only excuse only excuse for not being good is and it's a very viable and true excuse is i didn't know what movie i was in it's interesting that you say that because that was the very first thing george did i mean a director's job in large measure is tone and there are a lot of different ways it could be is it more comic is it more serious is it more you know what is the tone of this movie where, where how do i fit into this it was like a massive luxury for me as an actor to just not have to guess 
every single time I work with a director that I really admire and like, even some I don't, you know, you can learn from negative example too, but I just feel like I became a much better director. Your father is a good beat. I'll take care of you. Teach you the male sciences. I saw you in the yard playing sports. You're not very good. You know, find some other activities. I like to read. You read enough of those? Maybe. You could become a writer. One more thing, very important. Never hit a woman. Even if she stabs you with scissors. As you know, everybody does things differently. Everybody has their own process. Is there anything, it doesn't even have to be that big, but uh, that that you are going to carry forward into your own directing having coming out of this experience I, I think it's hard to overestimate the degree to which a director's kind of attitude openness comfort generosity pervades the set and does set a tone and george is the he does that better than i do he really makes everybody feel at home welcome and part of this process that's going to be wonderful that was definitely something where I thought, yes, I'm on the right track. This, and I'd like to be able to do it as well as as George does. And George was enormously respectful of, of the degree to which I, I take very seriously you know, my need to be there with my children on my half of the custody. I am there. I'm present. He blocked me off. He sent me back. I mean, he bent over backwards and had already thin schedule because he knew that was important to me. You didn't have to be there till midnight every night from six in the morning and sort of obliterate the rest of your life in order to do this. Those two things could coexist because he's got the spectacular wife. He's got his children. He's got a very rich, full life, you know. He's got to sell coffee. You got to sell tequila too. Tequila and coffee. It's That's like, no joke. It gets you in the morning and the night. <laughs> I tell you what, I wanted to be is I want to be George Clooney selling coffee and tequila. <laughs> that turns out to yeah. be that really frees you up to do the movies you want to do. See me and Julio down by the schoolyard. Got an announcement. Today, my nephew is officially a man. <laughs> Hey, so speaking of awesome actors, let me before because I because I'm I've been tasked with going all the way back to the beginning, and they've given me like twenty projects. So maybe we'll buzz hey, through. Don't don't be afraid to relieve yourself of some of that. <laughs> <laughs> I take my job very seriously here at Entertainment. I Weekly. know that's what I'm afraid of. But before we go back to where it started, let's talk for a second about where you are because I think it is really interesting, and I, the the work that you've been doing is great. And do you attribute it to just? <laughs> I mean, I kind of know the answer is you played in traffic long enough, so you're bound to get hit by some cars. Is that yet your performances are so good of late? Thank you. I think uh, that means a lot. I think there's two things. On the one hand, sometimes I have people, I, I hear things, people go, you know, you've really gotten better as you were older, which sometimes feels like you're not that bad looking in person, you know? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I had some performances as a younger person that I really liked. Now, maybe... And in truth, I, I mean, I knew Chucky Sullivan and his life and his life experiences or and, and felt that affinity for Ned Allen and Shakespeare in Love and, you know, <laughs> really kind of connected with the character in Chasing Amy. Part, there's, there's a number of factors. One, Changing lanes, you're great in that one. That, where I met Bradley, actually. Um, that, uh, there's a couple of things. One, starting off and then having ideas about, like, you get successful and you think... To, I thought, well, I have to maintain the success. Oh my gosh, this is a lot of money. You know, my mother made $28,000 a year. How could I, you know, justifiably say no to this or, you know, not understanding the value of turning things down. People talk about your choices and I want to go like, well, it's not like I was passing on the Scorsese. You know what I mean? Like, no, Marty, I'm good. I'm going to do surviving Christmas. You know, it's like part of our fates, our destinies are controlled by the opportunities we have in terms of material and direct. Absolutely. That's a big one. And then also... Um, I felt like as a as I've always felt more comfortable playing characters that weren't the traditional kind of protagonist that felt like kind of locked in to so you do this much better than I do. And it's not a backhanded compliment because you find a way to make characters interesting and flawed and real because you can't as a storyteller alienate the audience from your protagonist. If you put too much distance between them, it'll just sever that ability to feel empathy and to feel catharsis and to feel connected with them. And then you're just watching a movie about somebody you're either judging or don't like or don't believe. And that just blows the whole thing up. It's 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 deceptively difficult to play the leading man role. One of the nice things about getting older, if you're lucky, is you stop bullshitting yourself as much and you start going, OK, I, you know, I actually know where my feelings are. As a younger guy, I was like, no, I don't feel bad about that. Or no, I'm happy. You know, I wasn't really comfortable with what I really felt about things in the world. I was trying to figure that out. And the more I figured it out, the more accessible that was. I know what 
painful is and I know what disillusioned is and I know what ambivalent is and I know what nostalgic. And um, I had some really, I had a really sort of nadir experience around Justice League for a lot of different reasons. Not blaming anybody or making a thing, you know, there were a lot of, there's a lot of things that happened, but really what it was was I wasn't happy. I didn't like being there. I didn't think it was interesting. It didn't, and then some really shitty things, awful things happened. But I, that's when I was like, you know, I'm not going to do that you know, and write, direct. And so, in fact, talk to you about it. And you were a principal influence on that decision. I said, I want to do the things that will bring me joy. Like, then we went and did Last Duel, and I, th I had fun every day on this movie. I wasn't a star. I wasn't likable. I was a villain. I wasn't all the things I thought I was supposed to be when I started out. And yet it was a wonderful experience. It was all just stuff that came along that I wasn't chasing. My only thing is that now I live in fear of like, every time I do another movie, I'm like, do I still feel that? Am I still good? Am I, so I you know, and I'm afraid it's going to like go away, you know, cause it's elusive, but I'm, I'm happy now. I'm feeling it now. I'm, I love it. And I, I do think I'm, I've gotten better. I think people generally get better with age and experience. I imagine some might not. They might get in really bad corrosive habits. If you're smart, you go around and learn from people who are really good. And I, I think our friendship helped kind of inculcate that knowledge in me. I mean, you said to me really early, and I've always repeated it. I mean, this is when, I mean, we started writing Goodwill. You were 20 and I was 22. Really starkly, you were like, judge me for how good my good ideas are, not how bad my bad ideas are. And yeah. everyone's going to have bad, that's what it is. Everyone's got bad ideas. There's nobody I've worked with, the geniuses, who every now and again, David Fincher, you know, who is brilliant. There's every now and again, you go, mm, I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? But then you, but he's like, really? You think that's bad? You know, like then you find out he has the humility to go like, oh, huh. I remember that with the Coen brothers. More than once, one of them would come up and give me a note after a take. And then the other one would be off talking to another actor and would come up and give me the exact opposite note. And without fail, I mean, I would always say like, you know, Joel, Ethan just told me to do the opposite thing, or, or Ethan, Joel just told me to do the opposite thing. No matter who it was, the second guy who came up to me always said, oh, yeah, yeah, do what he said. Let me ask you a question about the business before I start running these old movies by you. Given The Last Duel, which I'm drinking my tea and shamelessly promoting with a Last Duel mug that I made, it obviously was a box office uh, failure. It wasn't the movie that people wanted to go see at the movie theater, but interestingly enough, it's it's like number one on iTunes. So it means that there is an audience, but it just was an audience that was unwilling to go in the middle of a pandemic to the theater. How does that make you feel, or how? What what is your what are you thinking? Kind of coming out with another with a drama. Did COVID just accelerate uh, something that was going to take ten or fifteen years, or? Is it coming back? You no, know, I, I won't hedge because that's always boring. Like, I could be wrong. I will say, like, when The Way Back came out, it, it was released in theaters, like, the week they closed the theaters. But even before then, I knew, like, this movie about, about grief and a child dying and alcoholism and recovery, and it's just not going to get adults out of their seats and come into the movies because look at Succession. You look at Mayor of Easton. You look at, like, there's these incredible things, or Roma, or, you know, there's these amazing things being done on streamers. So now it's not that, like, well, it's just, you know, um, some sort of, like, formulaic, you know, TV uh, uh, procedural like it was when we were kids and you could only watch it on, like, my dad had an 11-inch black and white TV. I think that you'll see, my guess would be, if I had to bet, is that drama, like Argo would not be made theatrically now. No, one that long. Ago. It would be a limited series. I think movies in theaters, they're going to become more expensive, eventized. They're mostly going to be for younger people and mostly about like, hey, I'm so into the Marvel Universe and I'm so care about these characters. I watched 15 of these movies. I can't wait to see what happens next. That there'll be 40 movies a year released theatrically, probably all kind of IP sequel animated, even the last duel, which that really cemented it. I just thought I don't, I've had bad movies that didn't work and I didn't blink. I know why the people didn't go because they weren't good. I like the last duel. You know, I like what we did. I like what we had to say. I think it's interesting. I'm really proud of it. So I was really confused. And then to see that it did well on streaming, I thought, well, there you go. A most unspeakable charge has been brought against you. Shock Legree entered our home. I request a duel to the death. If you lose, your wife will suffer dire consequences. One of us has lied. Let us let God decide. Heading back into, into a time machine, 
Um, they sent me a list of movies. So you want, we'll do a... Uh, if I thought I was going to be held accountable for these movies 20 years later. <laughs> 30 years, dude. 30 years. School ties. Let's start with that because that was the first time we did a feature film together. Give me a couple sentences. What do you remember? Loved it. Loved. That reminds me of just the joy I had being, just wanting to be an actor. I knew my nine lines back to front. I loved every day I was on a call sheet. Every day I got to come to work. You were there. It was in Boston. It was one of the best experiences of my life in that way. We moved into those apartments by the dump in Lowell, remember? We literally lived next to a dump and yeah. thought we were kings. And, <laughs> and you know, I, I, I knew I was playing the, like, one bully, shitty, anti-Semitic character in the movie. And so I figured it was probably not going to be great for me career-wise, but I loved it. Dazed and confused, and that was your first time working with or meeting Rick Linkletter and all those guys. He was both kind of a model to us as as we kind of, looked around and thought for the first time, like, maybe we can make our own movie. Maybe you don't need to, you know, you can do Reservoir Dogs or Slacker, or, you know, you can kind of like Clerks and do the right thing. Like people are kind of working outside of this system. And that was inspiring. I mean, like it's a bunch of 19 year old kids, like shooting nights with party scene. So it's sort of barely distinguishable to the time at the hotel, the time on the set. <laughs> They got to know, you know, Matt Matthew when he had you know, first starting out. He was so great with that. Like he had like one or two lines and Rick said, I got to admit, this guy's amazing. You know, Rory and Cole and Anthony Rapp, who had been in school ties and Joey and you know, Lauren Adams and, and Renee Zellweger. It was just like an abundance of riches. And, and then it bombed. It bombed. You know, nobody saw the movie, but it got great reviews. Right. And I remember yeah. like there was an Owen uh, Gleiberman review saying like once every decade or so. And I thought like, this is hyperbole, but it ended up being true. There's a real cult movie that people still talk about. It's one of the movies that I'm glad to be part of. Oh, and uh, Mitch, Carl, we'll be seeing each other again. <laughs> oh, that's it. I f***ing saw that, you little sack of shit. You two are f***ing dead. You hear me? You're f***ing dead! Well, now, speaking of DIY filmmaking, because the next one they had was Mallrats, but we, so you obviously got to talk about Kevin and Scott Mosier, and, but maybe fold them all in, because you've got Chasing Amy, obviously, which was a huge, huge inflection point in your life and career. Well, I was, once again, playing the bully in Mallrats, running around throwing people at their lockers. But I liked it. He's funny and smart and, and charming, and we got along. Well, he also, incidentally, I mean, this is not a small... Side note. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, yes. Kevin Kevin saved Goodwill Hunting. I mean, he brought that it. That is the reason happened. Goodwill Hunting got made. He is the reason Goodwill Hunting got made. Yeah, we were dead in the water. It would have been taken and turned around. I promised him um, I would thank him if we ever uh, got an Oscar and promptly forgot. Uh, and then I told him <laughs> if I ever win again, I swear to God, I'm going to thank you and forgot again. I mean, obviously, Gus and Robin were, were massive, massive, massive parts of that. And I think Francis. Spoke, Robin had done Jack with Francis and Francis said to me on the set one day, Robin called me asking about you, you know, like, who is this guy? God, he was a wonderful guy and funny. And the first time I ever got to hang out with somebody that talented and that famous, and it was quite a thing. And I remember walking down the street of Boston with him and I always, he had done Good Morning Vietnam and, you know, uh, Awakening and yeah, yeah, Fisher yeah, King yeah. And, all, and all everybody in Boston would say was Nano Nano, Mark for Mark. 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 But every day I come by your house and I pick you up. We go out, we have a few drinks and a few laughs and it's great. You know what the best part of my day is? For about 10 seconds from when I pull up to the curb and when I get to your door. Because I think maybe I'll get up there and I'll knock on the door and you won't be there. No goodbye, no see you later, no nothing. I'm just left. I don't know much, but I know that. I remember when you got the part of Armageddon, we kind of got split where people went, oh, well, Ben's the big movie guy and and Matt's like the serious guy because I did Saving Private Ryan. But the fact was that like we were desperate to get another job and I would have happily taken Armageddon. You would have happily taken Saving Private Ryan. You know what I mean? It's just like that's how it ended up. I remember I was shooting Ripley in Italy when that thing opened and i mean i forget how much money armageddon made but it was a massive hit that cast is lights out that is an incredible cast yeah. great yeah. bunch of actors uh, mike duncan you know we had so much fun and i was really interested in, like how does this work like how do you do this like this is real hollywood which i felt like i had never seen you know it dug out you know two stages at disney and for huge asteroid craters and I didn't even think about the fact that the basic premise of the movie was totally absurd. You know, like, why are they hiring, 
why are they making training oil drillers to be astronauts rather than astronauts to be oil drillers? You would think that the learning curve would be somewhat more steep on the uh, oil drillers to astronauts uh, route. But it was just, you know, it was just fun. And they, it was the right time. And Bruce was it's funny. Bruce, Bruce dropped out of a movie and as the deal for dropping out of this movie that wasn't working, they said, we get to put you in two movies. And they put him in our Marmageddon and the Sixth Sense. <laughs> oh, my God. Really? Yes. And yeah. I just, I didn't really, re I was a little naive about, like, the opinions people would form about you or the way in which the sort of Michael and Jerry's focus on aesthetics and sort of like, you guys got to go to the tanning bed. And they made me fix my teeth. That's right. You know, and like, work out and be sexy. Be sexy. Like, how do I do that? What is that, you know? go to the gym. I was like, okay, so running in the gym and, you know, putting on oil on my body and stuff. And it just turned out to be like a, a long form version of one of those uh, male topless calendars, like in a garage, carrying a tire, kind of greased up. And it says something that that's like the one movie of mine that my kids have watched that they'll kind of all admit to liking, even right. though they <laughs> relentlessly mock it and me and for like, what are you driving a tank on the moon, you know, but they, they had fun. You know what I mean? They, all of them yeah. liked it. They could make fun of me, but they kind of got it, you know, the sort of spirit of it. And uh, they won't even watch the town. So uh, there you have it. It's like, uh, you know, tell me about it. I'm deal I deal with that. My kids won't watch my stuff either, but. Harry, Harry, you can't do this to me. My job! Go take care of my little girl now. That's your job. Always thought of you as a son. Always. I'd be damn proud to have you marry Grace. Harry! You take care of yourself. Harry, no! I love you, Harry, I love you! Don't marry me! I'm so Wow, they have a lot of movies they want me to, to ask you about. But, um, you can skip to the ones that are interesting. Well, let's touch on Geely because uh, it's directed by one of our favorite directors, Marty Brest, uh, who made Midnight Run, of course, one of our favorites. We just screened a print of it the other night. What, where, does it, where does it sit with you now? You know, it's an interesting thing because it was a really easy choice. I loved Midnight Run. I loved Beverly Hills Cop. I loved Scent of a Woman. Uh, Marty's obviously enormously gifted. So there's no question in my mind that this was a guy I wanted to work with. His script was, and maybe like by today's contemporary, you know, there are things where like my daughter would be like, this is ableist and disgusting. And okay, the way we see stuff has changed a little bit and, or a lot in some cases. And there are things that seem sort of like they could work at, at the time. It was and, and that don't in retrospect, but really the truth about that movie, what it taught me was how much everything around a movie sort of dictates the way people see it. For being a movie that was such a famous bomb and a disaster, very few people actually saw the movie. Those who did, it doesn't work, by the way. It's not, a, it's a sort of horse's head on a cow's body. Marty tried to do a version that was his art movie. You know, she leaves me and I kind of die on the sand with Chris Walken and disappears. I was like, I don't know if this is gonna land, Marty, you know? And we joked about that it didn't really land. And then the studio, who at the time was intoxicated with the idea because I had begun having this relationship with Jennifer Lopez, which was selling a lot of magazines and appeared to generate a lot of sort of enthusiasm, they just predictably latched onto it. Like, they want a romantic comedy. They want the two of them together. You know, they want to see that, more of it. And it was just, you know, it was like that SNL sketch. Bad idea. It didn't work. And, and then we did five weeks of reshoots, which we knew were not going to work. It was a movie that didn't work. You try hard on those. And you do interesting things. And interestingly, I learned more about directing on that movie than anything else because Marty's a right. brilliant director, yes. really yes. gifted. It's not like it's worse than all. The, there's a bunch of horrible movies. And it probably, in terms of losing money, I've had five movies at least that have lost more money than Gilly has. I mean, only made it for $50 million. They killed the P&A spend. You right. know, I mean, Revolution was in profit that year. And there were other movies that came out weeks later that lost more money. It was just that it became a story in and of itself. The funny name, the, the Jennifer Lopez romance and overexposure of that. It was a kind of a perfect storm. I remember talking to Marty on the Friday it came out and I was like, it's just spectacular. It's like tsunami. It couldn't be worse. This <laughs> is as bad as it gets. But that, that, that contributed to this perception of me and also sort of the way I look. I look at those pictures now and I think I can see how people thought of this person as some like callow frat guy who's cavalier or 
or does it has too much or something. It gendered a lot of negative feelings in people about me. And there's that aspect of people that I got to see that was that was sad and it was hard and it was depressing and, and made me really question things and feel disappointed and, and have a lot of sort of self-doubt. But if Julie hadn't happened, I probably wouldn't have or the reaction to Julie hadn't happened, I probably wouldn't have ultimately decided, like, I don't really have any other avenue but to direct movies, which has turned out to be, like, the real love of my professional life. And so in, in those ways, it's it's a gift. And I did get to meet Jennifer, who um, the, the relationship with whom has been uh, really meaningful to me in my life. I remember you saying to me at that time, probably around the opening weekend, um, and I never forgot it. You said, uh, it, while you were having that kind of real honest, those, those real honest discussions, you said, I'm in the worst possible place you can be. You said, I can sell magazines, but not movie tickets. Yeah, I remember yeah. feeling like it was the worst of both worlds. That, yeah. that actually I was going to lose my opportunity. I always viewed it as the tax you paid to get the chance to do this work yeah. was to sacrifice yeah. your, your private life. And, your, and, and people were going to have to have license to you know, like make sport of you to some degree. And I didn't go into it blindly. But I thought, like, shit, like this is really not how I had hoped it would go. Where I'm going to yeah. still be, what, famous for being an asshole or a failure and not able to work. I just can't think of any worse outcome because I've never found any virtue in fame at all. Short of like, I've probably gotten out of a couple of tickets. I've gotten reservations, but the whole point was to be able to do this job. Uh, that was it. Otherwise, what is it worth? It just, it, it, it's corrosive. It changes the relationship you have with other people. It can engender resentment. It can get between you and other people. It's just, it doesn't, there's not a lot of merit to it, like fame in and of itself. I found one of the things that time has showed me is that it is oftentimes those moments of crisis or pain or, or perspective that actually engender change. that are strong enough to make you to go, F it. well, this doesn't work. I got to do something different because otherwise, I mean, I've definitely learned more from failure than I have from success. Well, uh, we're not ending on a note of failure because the postscript to the story is after 2006, you became a world renowned director. You won an Academy Award for Best Picture, which is really the mountain, the highest mountaintop in our business. But you've had an, a remarkable last decade and a half that is culminating with some of your best acting work uh, that you've ever done. And uh, The Tender Bar is another example of that. And uh, and I dare say your writing is pretty damn good. I was really proud of the the work. I love you, man. I want you to do all my interviews. This is <laughs> this is like. Uh, <laughs> are you cheap? <laughs> I'm free. Actually, I'm free. <laughs> to be honest, you know, I I really think I, I thank you. It, it's true. It ended up in a happy, much happier. No, not easy and not always smooth, but good. And I don't know that that would have been possible for me alone like doing this job in this world without somebody I grew up with, who I loved, who I knew loved me and had my back, who believed in me and whom like what the popularity of my movies or what people said about me wasn't going to change what they thought about me. And, and this friendship has been, you know, essential and defining and so important to me in my life. And I just talked about this the other day, you know, and, and especially there was a few critical times, which are private and I don't want to share, but which, where your support was so profoundly meaningful to me that I don't think I would have been able to be successful without it. So let me take this opportunity in this venerated bastion of media <laughs> entertainment weekly to thank you. In the Zoom interview, the hallowed Zoom interview. <laughs> we're, we're each a fan club of one for the other. So, um, all right, man, love you. I love you, buddy.